capacity by more than 250 beds. So, you know, it kind of worries me that this, this action by DBHDS, I'm hoping it doesn't set a precedent because the entire mental health system in Virginia is strained and the community system has become further strained by the closing of the beds in the state hospitals. A DBHDS is slated to receive ongoing general funds to bring salaries to 75% of the national average. The inequity created by the state's approach is going to have a significant negative impact on the CSB's ability to hire. Um, ARPA funds to the CSBs were designated solely to expand programs and not support, support workforce needs. And the state uh, ARPA funds for the state hospitals are to support staff and workforce needs. And we always have to remember too that ARPA funds from the federal government are one-time funds. And so we need to consider what's going to happen when these funds run out. So basically, in a nutshell, the state facilities are funded to operate at about 90%. It's been that way for quite a while now. So even though they're, they're funded to operate at 90% staffing, they frequently have 100% 100% bed utilization. So even during normal times, they're 90% staffed with 100% patients. Uh, so direct care staff wages need to be at market value in order to keep good staff within the facilities. Currently, direct care staff wages are below market value in the hospitals as well as the CSBs. We have to remember if the hospitals raise their staff wages, then the CSBs must also be able to raise their staff wages to market value. So to go over a little bit of the, um, the current state of hospital beds as reported by Commissioner Land, and she just gave a report yesterday to the House Behavioral Health Commission. Uh, back on July the 9th, the state ordered five of Virginia's eight adult state hospitals to close civil TDO admissions to reduce their bed capacity and build staffing levels. Um, no existing patients were discharged in an unsafe manner, uh, Commissioner Land reported, and staffing, Im as staffing improved, the hospitals reopened on a limited basis the number of beds that were, um, that were open due to these discharges. And DBHDS also used emergency facility funds to provide I'm sorry, they used emergency facility funds to procure, procure additional contract staff and for direct care recruitment and retention bonuses. So the individuals that have, have stayed in the hospitals, the ones who stayed through the pandemic, who stayed through the workforce kind of dwindling away with people quitting, they are being given bonuses because they were already below market value for their position. And of course, the state wants to keep their good staff. We need good people to take care of the patients within the system. And so they want to keep them. And so they're giving them bonuses, even though it's not an increase in their annual pay, it is a guaranteed bonus that they'll receive monthly or quarterly. I'm not sure how it's set up that can be added into the total that they make annually to, uh, to get them up to closer to market, or market value. The state due to the bed closings has called on private hospitals to make their beds available for TDO treatment. And uh, they want those, those beds open to all types of patients. And Virginia needs every possible step down and long-term care facility to accept patients who are ready for discharge from state facilities. All state, re all state hospitals are reopened. Um, Central State, Eastern State, South, uh, let's see, Southern Virginia Mental Health Institute, they all reopened um, 
let's see, I think it was last week. And so all state hospitals are currently reopened. So this is just a picture, a snapshot of what's going on with beds in Virginia now. When Commissioner Land originally closed the beds, we were at 255. We still have 248 that are unstaffed. So we have 248 beds now that are not operational because they are not staffed to uh, provide for the individuals in these beds. And so if you take a look at this, you can see um, the total beds maximum. And that number is uh, based on that number is based on the number of staff personnel that can uh, can attend individuals in a particular unit within the hospital. So if a unit used to be able to accept 20, but can now only accept seven, then that number is based on the number of beds available based on the number of staff people that are, are able to work in that unit. So Virginia is still in a bad place. We still have 248 beds that are not available. Okay, so um, during the special session that occurred this year in August, there were funds allotted. Uh, there were funds allotted to um, to provide the bonuses and to bring in contract workers and and address salary adjustments to increase the workforce to reopen hospitals in Virginia. It reopened the beds. The hospitals are open, and so. Um, during that special session, what was allocated as far as bonuses for direct care staff at behavioral health hospitals and training centers for next year, fiscal year 22, is 45 million for bonuses to direct care staff. For fiscal year 2023, the governor's intention is to fund at 76.9 million for salary adjustments. Now, during an even year, 2022 coming up is when the full budget is, is done and voted on. And so we would like to see this pass during the General Assembly session that begins in January. Odd years are when the budget can be amended, uh, but we would like to see this come into this year's budget. We have to remember there are elections coming up also, but this is what is intended, currently intended. And the American Rescue Plan Act or the ARPA funds that I've, I've mentioned um, will expand pilot programs for individuals with dementia who are ready for discharge and need nursing care. And I spoke briefly with Commissioner Land about the pilot programs that, that they're working on now actually have already implemented um, so to, to an extent, and basically what they're doing is because dementia patients going to a behavioral health hospital, it's not the exact, it's not really the right setting for them, and, uh, and it's all, and they're also taking a bed that would be more suitable for someone in a mental health crisis, and so these patients are being sent to nursing homes in Virginia, and then the state DBHDS is providing funds for caregivers or social workers or case managers to go in and assist with those dementia patients. The second part here uh, of funds allotted during the special session through the Amer or the you know the ARPA funds, um, or I'm sorry. The, what I was just speaking about, about the dementia patients, that part of that is 1.65 million for physical year 22. And the governor's intention for physical year 23 uh, is to fund at 1.65 million also. And then 5 million in ARPA funds are going towards permanent supportive housing in Northern Virginia to assist with bed crisis at state facilities. And we have to keep in mind that when someone is discharged, to be discharged from a state hospital and to reduce the number of individuals on the extraordinary barriers list, we have to have community services to provide those individuals. That could be permanent supportive housing. It could be links to other community services through the, the CSB. It depends on the person and what their needs are, but there is a crisis 
there is a great need in Northern Virginia for permanent supportive housing to assist with discharging individuals from the state hospitals. Now, I've, I've said a lot. Uh, one thing that has to be taken into consideration with all of this, it's, it's the entire continuum of care. It's not only the state behavioral health hospitals, but it's the community services boards and how the state hospital bed closings are going to impact them and how they are also going to be impacted if the state provides funds to increase wages for staff or the workforce in the behavioral health hospitals, then the CSBs also need to be more competitive in the wages that they pay. Um, they have to, you know, they have to also be able to provide fair market value. If the state hospitals are doing it, then the community services boards with the services they provide need to be able to provide those wages as well. All right, so I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of a comparison here between the state hospitals and the CSBs. And this snapshot here, and I know there's a lot of information on here, but remember earlier I mentioned that the ARPA funds that went to DBHDS to fund the state facilities or the state hospitals is primarily geared towards workforce. And there are some funds also in there to replace ventilation, water, sewer systems. Um, we have to keep in mind many of the hospitals in Virginia are extremely old. As a matter of fact, I was looking up Eastern State the other day while preparing this PowerPoint, you might have noticed a picture of Eastern State Hospital on an earlier slide. And it shows that it was built in the 1700s and it's the first psychiatric facility. And so, you know, they are pretty old, but the primary ARPA fund designation for DBHDS is to uh, increase the workforce and, and raise the wages to direct care staff to current market value, as well as bringing in contract staff. Now the contract staff that DBH anticipates bringing in, and I believe they've already started and brought some in, that's only 13 weeks. So at the end of 13 weeks, we're back to square one. How are we going to fund these positions? On the other side, if you look at the funds that were designated for the community services boards, those funds are to increase programs. Um, you'll see 10 million, the very top line here, for the continued expansion of community-based crisis services. And then, um, and then 5 million tied to state hospital discharges, uh, 5 million to expand community-based substance use disorder treatment. So the funds that were given to the CSB through ARPA funds through the special session at 48.3 million are to expand services. The one point, uh, the 174.3 million given to state facilities, the hospitals and the training centers are primarily to um, address the workforce concerns and to also uh, do some repairs within the facilities. So, you know, this is a little bit uneven here. Again, I go back to, I go back to, if we are going to fund the workforce in the state hospitals at fair market value, we have to also be able to do the same for the community services board staff. And in addition to that, if we build the workforce up to where it needs to be to reopen the closed 248 beds, then we need community services uh, in the, we need the services in the community so that they can be discharged and receive the effective, the effective treatment that they need to continue on to their road to re, on their road to recovery upon discharge from the hospital to keep the extraordinary barriers list down to be to do right by the patient. And so, you know, it's a little bit uneven here, which is not, um, is not a good thing. So uh, NAMI Virginia supports, fully supports the Virginia community of the Virginia Community Services Board's request that policymakers, including the governor and the General Assembly, put all 
of us first, meaning all of the, the public system first. This means that the entire public system for behavioral health and developmental disability services needs to be prioritized, as well as the individuals served in the system. This means that for every dollar the governor and the General Assembly decide to invest in state psychiatric facilities and training centers, at least an equal investment needs to be made in community-based care. NAMI Virginia fully supports that. We need the hospital beds, but we also need the community services that uh, individuals are going to need if they don't go into the hospital or upon release from the hospital. So we cannot forget about private providers either. Believe it or not, in Virginia, private providers serve approximately 80% of all Medicaid-funded community-based behavioral health services, and they are also facing workforce challenges that affects every service delivery. Um, so we must consider how challenges and changes within the state behavioral health system whether it be the state hospitals or the CSBs, affect the private providers and what can be done to assist the private providers in addressing these challenges. It might be, you know, it could be a number of things. I wrote down a few ideas here. Um, they have to go through different, different processes for state licensing. So it could be simplifying those processes. Um, it could be increasing reimbursement rates to allow with the cost of quality, uh, quality care, quality service provisions, a number of different ideas that we could come up with, but we, we don't want to forget about the private providers and how important they are as well. So for advocacy, state hospital beds are needed and must be reopening, reopened with funding to support 100% capacity and the workforce to meet the need of needs of 100% capacity. We need every bed and uh, we already, you know, have struggled for quite some time with a limited number of beds when people need a bed. We have all heard the stories where a police officer has to wait 25, 30, 35 hours with a patient because they cannot find a bed. Now, a lot of people are not going to agree with the hospital beds, and I'm going to address that in just a moment. And I want you to keep in mind NAMI Virginia's initial statement when this session was started. Um, but we do need every single bed, and COVID has only increased the need for these beds. The, the, case, the number of mental health cases has risen. And so if we were having a shortage and full capacity of beds pre-COVID. Now, post-COVID, we're not, you know, we're in the same place that we were pre-COVID plus 50, you know, plus times 50, because we have more cases of mental health in Virginia due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The second thing for advocacy that NAMI Virginia is working on and fully supporting is community services must be funded at least dollar for dollar to eliminate untimely barriers to discharge and support community-based recovery oriented services. And again, from everything I said previously, you can see how this all works hand in hand. Third, Virginia's behavioral health workforce must be increased and provided a competitive wage. We're losing people. We are understaffed in the community services board system and the state hospital system. It is, it has increased since COVID at 1,604 down in the state hospitals and about 21 and about 21% um, in the community services boards on average. Uh, but again, this is not a new problem. It was a problem pre-COVID. And so funding needs to be provided to support a competitive wage so that we can keep good workers because they, they, they take good care of the patients. And, and we don't want to have high turnover in this field. We want good people who are dedicated and have the heart for this work, but it's not fair for them to work, 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 work many, many hours 
when there's not enough staff and so they're treating four patients when they should only be treating two, uh, we want to be able to keep a good workforce and treat them properly. And last but not least, private providers and the challenges they face must be considered in all of the work that we do. And they are considered from the state office and advocacy work that we do. We always, we always put a strong consideration on the value that the pro private providers have within the system, within the continuum. Now, I mentioned earlier, some may not like NAMI Virginia advocating for hospital beds. You know, uh, this, this is a, people uh, so have strong feelings sometime around this issue. And at the beginning of this meeting, I said that NAMI Virginia supports a full community-based system of care to reduce the need for inpatient hospitalized care. But only when this system is in place, can NAMI Virginia safely support a reduction in state hospital beds and inpatient programs? And that system is not in place yet. So we do need every hospital bed. So I started this here that you can see on your screen, as some will say, hospital beds should be closed because they do more harm than good. What I would say to that is that statement may be true for some, but for others, it's not true. NAMI Virginia and the behavioral health community serve a diverse range of people with a diverse range of mental illnesses. And we all have to keep in mind that one size does not fit all. Many people need those hospital beds. Um, for many, the treatment in a hospital setting is the only way that they can or will reach recovery. And NAMI Virginia serves all individuals affected by mental illness. And we advocate for services to help all individuals where they are at in their recovery. And for many, that is a hospital bed. It's not for all, but it is for many. It's like if somebody doesn't need a hospital bed, but they need XYZ service, we're going to advocate for that also. Okay, but these hospital beds are desperately needed by many within the mental health, mental health system and spectrum. So um, this includes those that do not want or need hospitalized care the work that we do advocating for the hospital beds and, and the other advocacy work that we do. And also it includes those that do want and need hospitalized care because we all are different. We all don't think a lot, uh, think the same in every regard and we all have different needs. These beds are needed for many under the mental health umbrella. And if you think about it, mental health covers a wide spectrum. I mean, it covers your, uh, your panic attacks on up to your more serious mental illnesses. It covers dementia and, and it, it, covers, um, it covers a number of different patients, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. For example, not only dementia, but maybe forensic patients, they, they have to have these hospital beds. And so because NAMI Virginia serves everyone under the mental health umbrella, regardless of what their serious mental illness is, then we are going to advocate for what their needs are. Hospitalization is always the option of last resort, but when hospitalized care is needed, it must be available for the, pa the patients that have those needs. So I listed out a, a few reasons here why all state hospital beds are needed in Virginia. Again, before COVID, before COVID, we always have had a bed shortage, all right? Now we have more people with mental health concerns post-COVID, after COVID, and we have 248 fewer beds, all right? So that right there is, is a major, major problem. And plus, because of the hospital bed closings, the community system, public or private, is under a tremendous strain. They, they can't keep up with the needs. They're, they're doing their best. The CSBs are awesome working 24 seven, the private providers, the same, but, but they are under tremendous strain. And it doesn't only stop there. It trickles into law enforcement also. 
uh, sheriff told me about, it's been maybe a week and a half ago, that uh, one of his deputies sat with the patient for 31 hours because there were no beds to be found. And if you think about that from both points of view, number one, the officer is not on the street doing what he needs to be doing. He's sitting with the patient all of this time. But, but he does get relief when his, you know, part, when his shift is over and someone comes to relieve him. But think about the patient. Can you imagine being a patient in a mental health crisis and sitting, waiting for a bed for 31 hours? I mean, to me, that is cruel and unusual punishment. And it is absolutely uncalled for and unnecessary. And so um, that is one of the big considerations for reopening these beds and not having the shortage in Virginia. Also, when we don't have an adequate number of state hospital beds, then uh, ER, emergency room boarding um, and, and release, releasing people rapidly before they're really stabilized happens. And what does that do? That causes a number of things. The people are being released from a medical setting when they went into the hospital for care. They're being released before they're ready. They're, um, they're given just a, a quick fix and they're, they're boarded for maybe 24 hours and then they're sent out. That creates recidivism in and out the door. How many times is that person going to reach out for the help that they know that they need before they become so frustrated that they finally say, what good is it? And then they're going to suffer in silence and in pain. That is so wrong and that cannot happen. That's another reason we need state hospital beds. Private hospitals are not always available to all patients. Private hospitals, you know, they're private. They're not mandated to accept all patients like the state hospitals are. The private hospitals can be more selective. So if they have a person with a more serious mental illness that's in total crisis, they can always say, nope, we're not gonna take him or her. They can be selective. Also, not all patients have the ability to pay. And so if they go to a private hospital and they don't have the ability to pay, or their insurance is not accepted, the private hospital can turn them away. And so having the state hospitals as a bed of last resort is crucial. We need those hospital beds. Um, and state hospitals are necessary to stabilize and, re and support uh, step down, least restrictive community treatment services. So when someone goes into the state hospital, we know that when they're discharged, that they are linked to the proper community treatment services that they need. They've, they've got their care team in the state hospital that's been working with them. They know what they need. Those links are prepared upon discharge. And so they are able to, uh, able to get linked to those step-down services. Sometimes longer-term care is needed for individuals with your more serious mental illnesses. You can't get that a lot of times in the private hospitals. You need the state hospitals to get the longer term care. Another big one, and this is something that I have uh, heard time and again from patients who have been in hospitals. They've gone into a hospital and, um, and uh, they uh, receive psychiatric drugs. And first off, they're a little bit scared. They feel a little bit different with those. And we know with many antipsychotic drugs, it takes 14 to 30 days for them to reach their therapeutic level. And monitoring and adjustment time is required to make sure that individuals are receiving the proper medication, the proper dosage. And so time is needed to, to make sure. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to be in the hospital for 14 to 30 days. I'm saying for some people, again, I mentioned how we serve everyone under the mental health spectrum. But for the individuals that, that this is needed for, say they've had problems with their medication, the right one just couldn't be found, that monitoring time is essential for many people. We want everybody to reach the road to recovery. We want all to recover. And so we need to meet them where they are and provide the services 
that they need. And for many, it's a state hospital bed. Um, and also I've mentioned this, uh, how Virginia currently does not have a comprehensive, accessible, fully integrated community mental health care system. And, um, you know, in until in place, uh, until that's in place, hospital beds are in need, are needed. Um, I'm not going to go down the whole list. You can kind of look at this on your own, but I do want to point out a couple of other things. For some people, state hospital beds are the only refuge they have. They're mental, mental, they have a mental illness. And if you look up the statistics, we have somewhere, it depends on which state you're looking at, which area, but you know, anywhere from 30 to 50% of homeless individuals have a mental illness. And so sometimes this is the only place that they can go for that refuge to get the proper supports that they need to treat their mental illness, to get them back on the road to recovery. And then also having the state hospital beds can prevent others from not becoming incarcerated when they go into crisis. We don't know what's going to happen. If the police are called in, then they could be incarcerated. And we all know that jail is not the place to treat an individual with mental illness. They need the medical care that they can get in a hospital, which might be the only option for many individuals. Also, we have boarding houses that can be very unsafe and are, and are not real expensive. And a lot of people with um, mental illness may not be able to to afford a really good um, place to live. And these are pro a lot of these boarding houses are profit seeking. And so often uh, going into a state hospital or having that hospital bed available is needed to get someone on track and help to link them to proper housing. And there are a few more things that you can see on here. NAMI Coastal Virginia has a list of the reason that state hospital beds are needed. And so I would encourage I would encourage everyone to reach out, and you can either reach out to NAMI Coastal Virginia or NAMI Virginia, and we can provide you with that list. And I already mentioned that they can be uh, the only place for forensic uh, patients, and and that need will never be met with a private bed. So if for nothing else, it's it's needed for forensic patients. And I know I have given you a lot to think about. There have been a number of meetings. Uh, and again, the latest one was yesterday with the, help, with the House Behavioral Health Commission and Commissioner Land did present at that meeting. The information that I've provided here, I received from her on the number of beds uh, being still inaccessible at this point is, is as, of, as of yesterday, it's at 248 statewide. All hospitals are open. However, we are still down 248 beds and we need additional funding to reopen those beds. We need funding to increase the workforce and we also need dollar for dollar funding so that the community services boards can keep up with those services and pay a fair market wage to uh, their staff as well. And that's kind of a lot, I know, I'm open for questions. <laughs> yes, I know I've given you a lot to think about. So if there are any questions, I'm certainly open, open to try to answer those for you. Kathy, if, if everyone would uh, just, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box. We're going to try to get to questions a little bit later. But what we wanted to do now is, first of all, to thank Kathy for such a wonderful, enlightening, and educational. That was tremendous. Uh, it certainly showed us how vital it is that we be very vocal advocates for ourselves and our loved ones. It's uh, almost a crisis situation, as Kathy has shown. Um, I, my name is Jen Williams. I work in the office at NAMI Coastal Virginia, and I can tell you from the amount of phone calls that we receive from loved ones that are having so much difficulty finding housing, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, important point 
that we need to stay on top of this. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so that's why we're here tonight to ask for your help in, in advocating to your state senator and your state legislator. I would ask everybody to please open the chat box on Zoom and you will see that there are three different uh, links. The one in the middle says messages for advocates to use. That is the message that Kathy has very kindly created that we can use. So we do not have to do anything other than sign our name, although we may wanna put our address down there so that the person that you're sending it to, the Senator or the legislator, I mean, delegate, so they know that you can vote for them or against them. So that's the first thing. Um, I hope that everybody's able to, uh, to get to the chat box. If you don't know what that is, if you go to the very bottom of your screen, you will see different icons and right in the middle, it says chat. If you just click on that, it will open. And you can copy and paste that link from there onto wherever you wanna save it to. And then you open it up and you will see what, what Kathy has created. Um, if you are not sure of who your delegate and your Senator is, you can go to a website called Who's My Legislator, Virginia. And it, and it asks you to enter your street address with your zip code and it will pull up the name of your state senator and your delegate. But in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen and just bear with me a moment. Uh, okay, I've been, I've been told that maybe I need to copy and paste this in again. And so I shall do that. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see it now. So it's the middle, the middle one, message for advocates to use. If you would like to read more about what Kathy talked about, the very first one, they are listed, NAMI Virginia Hospital Bed Crisis Bullet Points. That is more in-depth information, but this, this PowerPoint that Kathy created is just phenomenal. Thank you. Can everybody see this list of delegates? Kathy, can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so these are a list of the delegates in our area. I am not sure if there are people outside of our area who are with us tonight. If so, um, I would go to who's my legislator and you can find out that way. But these are the list of the delegates. And then beneath that are the list of the senators. And so um, I don't know if I could get them all on one screen. Okay. And if you do not know who your legislator is, who your delegate and who your senator is, again, you can go to Who's My Legislator Virginia and you just type in your address and it will punch it right up. And then you could send that on to them. If you have a personal story, something that has happened to you or a loved one, that always helps make a difference. It, it helps um, them know that you're not just a person who really has no, uh, no, nothing to do with mental health. You're just sending an email just in general. Um, if you can do, just include something that has happened to you or a loved one, succinctly, short and sweet, uh, because they get a lot of emails. And so the shorter, the better to get the point across. All right. I'm going to stop. Sure. 
All right, so I guess what we'll do at this point is uh, take a look in the chat section and see if we have any questions for Kathy. Okay, where, uh, where is Newport News and Hampton, Virginia? You mean uh, what delegate and Senator do you have? It, it, okay, all right, can you go to who's my legislator, Virginia? Great. If you could just do that, then then they'll you'll be able to pull them up. And thank you for coming from Newport News and Hampton. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, questions for Kathy? And you know, I, I honestly. The, I like to think that everyone has a good heart and that people truly do care, but they are um, overworked, they're underpaid, they have limited resources, they don't know which aspects of the system to turn to because we, we don't have enough services and uh, we don't have a big enough workforce to fund the services that we do need. But I would like to think the criminal justice system, I mean, they honestly, they do, I think they do truly try, but they can only use the tools that they have available to them in their toolbox. So we need that added workforce. We need the services that are required to meet the mental health needs of everyone who needs the care in Virginia. And, and accesses the system. So thank you. Yes, I'm glad you're with us tonight. And I can't see if there are any more, if someone wants to read them to me or tell me. Um, okay. So there is a great question in the box that says, how do you this statement with long-term and more comprehensive reform efforts to make effective and more prepared? What is Murray currently doing in terms of advocacy to ensure the proper programming is being implemented at the community level? How can person go bond or advocate for client shared practice to be emphasized? Okay, that is a long question, so I may have to get part of it, uh, part of it repeated. Um, but let me start with a couple of a couple of pieces that I did pick up in that, and that's Marcus Alert and the 988 system. Also, um, think about it. We are implementing the Marcus Alert. You know, a wonderful crisis care team that can go out and assist people in crisis. But even though we have this awesome team, what's going to happen if we don't have the services the person in crisis needs? If the crisis team says they need a hospital bed or they need um, a, 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 a crisis care unit or whatever the case might be, what happens if we don't have that for them to go to? So Marcus Alert is awesome. And I think that all the advocacy work that we are doing is going to just further complement that program because we are advocating for workforce, funding for the workforce. And then of course, you know, you see the services that are going to be funded that need to be increased through the VACSB. Now, one of the big concerns here is ARPA funds are one-time funds, okay? They're one-time funds. They're not going to, they're going to go away. That money was given by the federal government and has to be spent by a certain date. So what we're going to run, run into here is, this, is the question, will the state of Virginia to continue to fund these programs, paying the workforce what they need to be paid, at market value or 75% of market value actually. Will they continue, to, will they open the beds and continue to keep the beds open at 100% 100, 100 capacity? Will they provide funding to the community services board to increase the boards, to increase the services? And so we are advocating for all of that. Um, and so it really will go hand in hand. We, we need the funding, we need all the beds, we need to pay our workforce, increase our workforce and expand our community services. And we also need to view the community services 
Uh, we also need to give them the value that they deserve in our views. And that's the dollar for dollar funding. And if you want to read the parts I missed. Um, Okay, clients, okay, well, for the Marcus Alert system, they do have committees, they uh, send out surveys, they send out information. Um, Client-centered services in the market Marcus Alert program, I'm trying to kind of understand that wording a little bit because the Marcus Alert program is a community crisis care team. And so um, I, think, I think what the question what the questioner is asking is how can someone advocate for a person that's identified through the Marcus Alert as needing services? How can the individual advocate for those community services, those client services within the community? So if I'm understanding that correctly, you can advocate through NAMI. We send out action alerts. We send out advocacy alerts. We have a NAMI Smarts for Advocacy training that's going to be happening in November. And so if you're not already involved with receiving advocacy information from NAMI and you want to start doing that type of work, I would suggest that you uh, pop an email and we'll add you to our quorum listserv so that you will get those advocacy and action alerts. We, uh, uh, we let people know um, when they need to advocate, uh, when they, you know, whether it's by phone, email at the General Assembly, in person with their local legislator, whatever the case might be. We also provide the advocacy training. I don't have an exact date in November yet. One of the trainers is actually here with us tonight. Max, he's awesome. Um, and they're deciding the exact date of the November NAMI Smarts for advocacy training I believe he told me it's next Tuesday. So we will have that date soon. And then um, and then also attend advocacy day. NAMI Virginia does an advocacy day every year towards the end of January or the first week of February, where we all go down to the General Assembly. Hopefully, you know, it depends on COVID and, and self, you know, and, and where we are with that. But um, come to Advocacy Day, meet legislators, meet other advocates, and become familiar with the process. And again, take the training, sign up for our alerts. We would love to bring you in. Advocates are an extremely important part of who we are and what we do. Did I get all the questions? Okay, good. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. and and. Um, we're glad you're doing well, and uh, that's what it's all about. And, and thank you for sharing that re resource with everyone else in the session tonight. Um, I'm sure that's beneficial, and, and someone here tonight may be able to utilize that. So thank you so much. Okay, well, if that's all of the questions, um, I just want to let you know what an honor it is to be here in the coastal area with NAMI Coastal and all of you tonight. I am so glad that we are able to get together and talk about this and, and, and answer questions and have discussions because I always want to learn, I always want to hear I, I always like to share, and I feel like it's important for everyone to understand what's going on. And NAMI Virginia, as well as NAMI Coastal and other affiliates throughout the state are going to continue to work for you. And um, again, let us know if you'd like to be added to the listserv. Come and attend a NAMI Coastal meeting, and I hope to be with you again soon. And I want to thank Kathy again for being here tonight and Sandy, giving us such a wonderful uh, demonstration of why it's so important that we advocate. If you have any questions or you have any difficulty with finding out who your legislator is, please call our office. We are glad to help you in any way we can. Remember that we do go up to the General Assembly, as Kathy said, hopefully we will be there uh, 
this uh, winter. We would love to have you go with us and uh, and help us in our in our endeavor to help you. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us tonight. We we appreciate your time. Have a good rest of your evening.